Policy Objects Part 3. In this nugget, we continue our discussion of group policy objects, and this is Part 3 where we start off with a discussion of delegation. Now, we talked about delegation in a previous nugget, but it was really only to manage the links. Our delegation discussion here takes it a step further so that you can create your own group policy objects as well as manage them. We'll, we'll also take a look at troubleshooting group policy objects. We, we'll take a look at things such as slow links, which can significantly affect the application of certain group policy objects. We'll take a look at result instead of policy, so that you can not only identify existing policies, but also what policies would take place if you were to make a change to certain things, the difference between uh, looking at it in logging mode and looking at RSOP in planning mode. We'll also take a look at GPO2. And this is a great way to identify just the overall health of your group policies. And then uh, FRS is, is relevant here in NTFRSUTL and FRS Diag. These are sysvol uh, functions that take place to make sure that all of our Active Directory group policy object pieces are replicated back and forth between domain controllers. And so we'll take a look at those utilities too. Now when it comes to editing and managing group policy objects, you want to try to keep a very short list of who's going to be doing those things. Enough so that if someone goes on vacation and an emergency comes up, someone else is still around to be able to manage it, but not so many people that the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing because you can see how powerful policies can be, and in the wrong hands, inexperienced hands, or in malicious hands, this could really get to be a mess. So you really need to be careful to keep track of who's responsible for group policies. Now, one thing I did show you in a previous nugget is that using the delegation of control wizard on an organizational unit, I can allow a specific user or a group the ability to manage group policy object links. However, we might want to take that a step further. For example, on the Phoenix organizational unit, by going to its group policy tab here, we see that we have an existing policy there that we've been working with in the past. And on the security tab, I can give an additional user or group account the ability to manage this specific group policy object. Maybe I want to add Phoenix admins you know, Phoenix Admin 01, that specific user account, the ability not only to read the policy, but to be able to write, create child objects, and delete child objects as well. Now, the other step I would need to take, though, because this is not complete, that Phoenix Admin 01 user account would still not be able to manage the policy here in the Phoenix OU. Next, I have to delegate control to that specific user, and I've done that in the past, so I'm going to quickly go through this. And once we've gone ahead and delegated control of this person so that they can manage the group policy links, we'll see that that person will be able to work with those policies from within the Phoenix organizational unit. And the reason why we need to take that additional step is because, by default, any non-administrator still cannot manage links unless we give them that delegated level of control. So then now that I've gone ahead and given the appropriate permissions to this group policy object to Phoenix Admin 01, and since I've delegated control to them, now once they've added the admin pack.msi uh, installation to their local system, we can go to Active Directory Users and Computers as this user. And by the way, I'm on a Windows XP computer, which obviously is not a domain controller. And when I use Active Directory Users and Computers to go to the properties of an organizational unit and go to Group Policy, anytime I edit this policy, it always connects to the PDC emulator. So even if the PDC emulator is on the other side of the world in you know, Bangladesh or India or any other country or something like that, this is going to likely be then a WAN connection. So just be aware of that. Now what you could do is you could change the focus. Let me cancel out of this. I could change the focus of this and connect to a different domain controller and just select something else here. Uh, however, you just need to be aware of the fact that by default it's going to go to the PDC emulator. In any case, let's go to the group policy now. Now that I have the appropriate permissions on the Phoenix policy, I can double click on this. And I can go into some administrative template down here, for example. Maybe something from the start menu and taskbar. And I can go to, I don't know, remove my documents icon from the start menu. Enable. Apply. Looks like I have permission because it let me apply it. So that's the, an example of how I can delegate control of an organizational unit's group policy to somebody else. Now then, what if that was not enough? What if we needed to also use that Phoenix Admin 01 account to create additional policies for Phoenix here? Well, if that's the case, I'm going to need to go to that user's account, and I need to change their group membership so that I can add them to uh, the group policy creator owners group. So I'll just go to group policy creator owners group, and we see that it's uh, there right now. So what this does is gives me the ability to create a, a group policy object. Once I've created it, I become the owner, and the owners have full control over group policy objects. 
uh, or at least over the group policy objects that they create. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at this user account, which is logged back on again now that I've changed their group membership. And I'm going to go back again into my administrative tools to go back to Active Directory users and computers. And we'll see that now I'll be able to go to that particular organizational unit. And I'll be able to right click here, choose properties, go to the po group policy tab now. And now I can create to create a new group policy object. I don't even bother naming it. But you see the idea here. Now I can create this new item. Then I can go into its uh, properties and configure various template settings and all this kind of stuff. So now I have pretty much have full control over that group policy object that I created. Uh, in fact, if we go to the properties of that group policy object and go to security, we see that because I'm a member of the group policy creator owner security group, it's automatically given me all this control of that security, of, of this uh, group policy object now. Now, even though I'm a member of the cr uh, group policy creator owner's security group, I still have to have delegated permission over an organizational unit in order to create and manage a group policy object. For example, if I go to this Phoenix Admins uh, organizational unit here, go to its properties and go to group policy, notice that I can't create anything new. All of this stuff is grayed out here. That's because no one ever delegated control of this organizational unit to me. Policies can get to be extremely complex, and that's when you're going to have to know something about how to troubleshoot these things. Because if it's only a couple of policies that you've got to manage, well, you can kind of click your way through them and probably figure something out within not too much of a duration of time. But if you've got multiple policies, multiple organizational units, and you've got sub-OUs of sub-OUs, and you've got block policy inheritance in some places, no override in other places, uh, security group filterings for certain policies in other locations, wow, you're going to have a real menagerie of group policy objects to try to have to troubleshoot. And really, it's probably just too much to juggle all in your head at one time. So we're going to take a look at some ways of managing this a little bit more easily. First thing to understand, I think, is that you want to understand something about slow links. Now, that doesn't sound like a troubleshooting issue directly. However, group policy objects do not process all of their functions over what it considers to be a slow link, which by default is 500 kilobits per second or slower. So what you'll do is to go to the respective group, uh, group policy that you need and go to Computer Configuration Administrative Templates System in Group Policy. And then you'll have this policy here, Group Policy Slow Link Detection. Now, as I mentioned, certain things will process differently or won't, will not process at all if a slow link is detected. And the way system determines if there's a slow link between the client and the source of the policy is it will go ahead and it sends actual pings across the wire and it waits to see what the response time is and it sends it through an algorithm to determine whether or not there's actually a slow link there. Some things will not process at all using a slow link, such as software deployment. I mean, after all, that could be a good thing. If I've got only a 128 kilobit per second connection, it's a WAN connection from two different continents, I don't want to deploy all of Office 2003 across that slow WAN link. So the slow link detection can be good in that respect. Other things that it could affect would be things such as user profiles. And in fact, there's a whole section for that under user profiles as well. And you can disable the detection of slow network connections here as well. For example, by default, if you have a slow network, the slow network that's detected, it will only load the local user profile, and it will not attempt to download a roaming user profile. So getting back to the group policy setting here, we can again go to the group policy slow link detection and enable this, and specify an explicit number of kilobits per second to determine what a slow link is if we want. And this might be necessary if we absolutely have to get some policies and some settings pushed out over the wire, but we are slower than 500 kilobits per second. We're just going to have to bite the bullet and say, hey, the fastest we've got is a 256K WAN link, but I'm going to put in 128K just in case. And then now that's going to be considered slow, 128. And I'll just have to be a little bit more patient with certain kinds of policies that will have to process over a slower WAN link. Now, a couple other things we can do is to use the resultant set of policy. Now, this really uh, manifests itself in, wow, several different ways. I mean, you can do it from a Windows XP client if you want by going into Help and Support Center. And then once you're in Help and Support Center, you can go down to the Tools down at the bottom. If this ever shows up here, I guess the system's kind of falling. So there we go. Go down to Tools down here. And then we can go over here to System Information. And you can look for Advanced System Information. Or you can just look for basic information. But basically, you can get to the advanced system information here. And this is the most direct way to get to what we're looking for. And then look for Group Policy Settings Apply. Just click on this link right here. And then what will happen is it will run the group policy settings that are applying to the currently logged on user to the currently logged on computer.
Now my screen resolution is a little bit small here, so it's gonna, I'm going to have to cram it all together here a little bit. But it shows you the name of the computer, some pertinent information as to which policies are being run. Here's the friendly name of the policy, Phoenix policy. Here's its GUID. Here's the default domain policy. Both of those are applying to this system. Here's the group membership of the user that is currently logged on. That has importance because you might have uh, filtering applied to a specific policy that you'll need to know about. You need to know what groups they're members of. So it shows you all the scripts that will run, all the different settings that have been deployed here. Here's Office 2003, for example, that we've got. Uh, so all of these things will then show you which policies are taking a place. Here's that hash value that I gave for sol.exe so that we wouldn't run that software application. And you can go on and on and on and see a lot of these different settings that are available here for both the user and for the computer. And then as I scroll further on down to the bottom, you can see, you see that we can save this report to an HTM file, which is very handy for reporting, and then I can email it to somebody else if I'm having some troubleshooting issues or something like that. And then I can also run the full resultant set of policy tool from within this Windows XP computer. And then what that does is it allows me to run it against this system, and it allows me to identify specific policies. Now this looks just like a normal uh, group policy object editor. However, it only shows me the settings that are actually turned on in this, so I don't have to look at any of the other 600 policies and kind of sort through them all. This just shows me only those ones that are actually being enacted. For example, my auto enrollment settings here, any uh, software restriction settings that I have configured, all that kind of thing. Now another way of running the resultant set of policy is to do it from a command, or actually from an uh, interface here as well. I can right click on a specific user account, choose all tasks, and I can choose resultant set of policy, and I can do it in planning mode or logging mode. And you must distinguish between these two. Now re just remember that logging only records facts of what's already present. This is going to tell me what policies are already applying to this user when they log on to a specific computer. Planning mode allows me to configure what-if scenarios. What if I were to use this user account and move it into a different organizational unit that had different uh, group policy objects attached to it? Or I had that user log on to a different computer. So if I change something up, that's what this planning mode is about. Let's go ahead and take a look at the logging one first of all. And we can say, what would happen if this user were to log on to another computer? And we'll just give it client 01, for example. And we can go ahead and click on next. And we want to say, we want to look at this specific user, Phoenix user 01. Now, it only gives me that specific user because that's the account that I right clicked on to start the wizard in the first place. So it kind of locks me into that one. And then I can also uh, just continue to get a summary here to see what it's going to do. And I click on next. It actually goes ahead and runs that analysis now for me so that when I click on finish, I can see the resultant set of policy. And again, all of these are going to be only the settings that we've specifically configured here as well. So any security settings that we've specifically configured, again, there's my auto-enrollment settings and all that kind of stuff. Now, if I want to run this in, in logging, or rather in a planning mode instead, I can right-click on it, the user again, choose all tasks, and choose resultant set of policy in planning mode. And it's going to, again, apply to this specific user. But I can say, what would happen if I were to move that user into a different container, into the Tucson organizational unit? And what if I were to give them a different computer to log on to? And I don't really have another computer, but I could choose a different computer there if I needed to as well. So anyway, I'll go ahead and stick with the different container that I selected here. Stay with one thing here. I can also skip to the final pages of the wizard if that's all I want to know about, if I don't want to change any of the other information, such as to identify what would happen if I was over a slow network connection. Remember when I showed you that the slow network connections affect policies different ways? Well, we can see, hey, what would happen if we put this user on the other side of a WAN link? Would that cause them to not have their software deployed or anything like that? Uh, we can also see what would happen if we decided to enable loopback processing, which we talked at an earlier point in time here. And we can see what would happen if we put them in a different site if we had more than one. And we can also identify... Uh, different locations for my users. If I wanted to see what would happen if they were in a different location besides Phoenix users, I could again locate a different organizational unit here as well. So anyway, I just go ahead and identify whichever what-if scenarios would interest me. I might also want to see what would happen if I were to make this user a member of a different security group. What would happen if I made this user a member of the domain admin security group, for example? Well, I would click on add, and I would add in here domain admins and then there they are. They're not actually a member of that security group. I'm just saying what would happen if I made them a member of that security group. And then I would go ahead and click on Next. And again, you can see here Then I can identify what computer security groups the computer is a member of as well. Again, you can change that if you want to. And then you can also see what would happen if you were to link certain WMI filters to it as well, of which I don't have any, so we won't use any at this current time except for the it says all linked filters, but there aren't any. Or you can specify only specific filters as well for both user and computer. 
Uh, and that's pretty much it. Then you just click on next, and it's going to go ahead and run this whole what if scenario. When you click on finish, it identifies what would happen if we did all of those things that we talked about. And once again, this only shows me the actual settings that are enabled for this specific user account. If I can go to the software settings, for example, I don't see anything there. If I go to the software settings down here, nothing there. If I go to folder redirection, indeed, we do have the My Documents folder being redirected to the home directory. And we saw that we had enacted that from a previous nugget a while back. You know, a couple of other ways of getting the same kind of results. I could go to command line and run rsop.msc, just open up the MMC console for this, and it logs against the existing user on the existing computer for the time being. But once again, I can right-click here, change that query, and make it some other computer, make it some other user, any of those other things you've already seen me do, you can now change. Also, if I originally ran this and I kind of just let it sit there and then I made some other policy changes, I could see what the effective result of those policy changes will be. Now, by right-clicking here and choosing Refresh the Query, it allows me to see the differences. Now, keep in mind also that with the Delegation of Control Wizard, you can also delegate who has the ability to do that. So I could right-click and choose Delegate Control once again and click on Next. And again, I could add you know, whichever security group I want or user. Uh, Phoenix admins, let's just add the whole security group here in this case, for example. Click on Next. And then I can give them the ability to uh, generate result instead of policy for planning and or logging mode. And that's pretty much all you have to do with that, to be able to give somebody the ability to plan or log using RSOP. Now, the other command line tool I have, besides rsop.msc, which really isn't a command line, it just opens up a, a console for us, is to use the GP result tool. And I can run GP result, and I can send that out to a text file, for example. And I'll just put that on the C drive. It's already going to go there by default, but I'll explicitly put it in there. And now what it's going to do is going to put it out to that particular file. This can be kind of verbose information, so that's why I usually like to put it out to, uh, to that text file. So I'll double-click on this now. And then I can identify, again, specific information about this, what it thinks the slow link threshold is by default, uh, whether it detected a slow link when it logged on to this local user profile for the trainer and it did not uh, apparently see a slow link at that particular time. Shows me what group policy objects will apply to this particular user, uh, security settings, all different kinds of things here that could be pertinent to identifying why a policy is or is not running. Another tool I like is also GPO tool, and with this tool, it will identify the health of all of the various pieces of a policy. For example, all of its contents in the sysvol, uh, all of the GUIDs, make sure that everything matches between domain controllers and that everything is okay. And uh, really, there's nothing much to show you here unless there's a problem. Fortunately, I don't have a problem, but if there's a problem, it'll show you a mismatch between the policies, and it can compare this against any other domain controllers that you have. If I do uh, the same command, I do a forward slash verbose, and it gives you, of course, exactly that, even more verbose information about it, exactly what the name of the policy is, when it was created, uh, how many versions it's had, uh, what the sysvol version is. This would be an interesting issue, for example, if the, the directory services version, in other words, Active Directory, logs that there's been two changes to the user, but the sysvol says three. Well, that probably means that some other domain controller elsewhere has made a change, and it has not yet synced up. Now, finally, there's another tool I ought to point out to you, and that will address both the default domain policy and the default domain controller's policy. The default domain policy, of course, being on the domain, uh, and under the group policy tab here, the default domain policy. Now, I mentioned earlier that some people say you should never mess with this anyway, but in case you have or somebody else has, and they've totally messed this up, and it's really affecting the functionality of your domain, and you're having very great difficulty in troubleshooting it, or if you're running in the same kind of a situation with the default domain controller's group policy object here, then you can use a command line utility called DCGPO fix. And if you run this tool, what it will do is it'll restore both of those policies to their pristine state that they were in immediately after an installation of the domain. But it's a shotgun blast, and it really is a widespread tool, and you want to use it only in a last-ditch effort after all of your other troubleshooting has failed, because it will reset everything back to the way it was. And then if I just type GPO fix and DC GPO fix and press enter, it's going to attempt to repair both the default domain policy and the default domain controller's policy. If I want to, I can also run DC GPO fix, and then I can run with the target of just the default domain policy. You just type in the word domain, that doesn't represent anything. Or the default domain controller's policy, either one. Now in my case, I don't actually want to do that, so I'll just type in no for uh, N for no, and then get out of it. Now then finally, remember that group policy objects really have a lot to do with replication between sysvol directories between our domain controllers. 
typically, anytime there's been a change made to a sysvol file, it will automatically detect that and replicate that change immediately to other replication partners. However, there's going to be times when there's going to be a network interruption or some other reason for that replication not to take place. And if that's the case, there are a couple of tools you can use to help you diagnose if there has been a problem or if there's a mismatch between your copies of the sysvol on your different domain controllers. One of those tools is NTFRSUTL, and if we do that and run for, with a space DS, for example, that'll identify the directory services with this local domain controller, and it gives you extremely verbose information about the domain controller and all the various associated settings included in the file replication service for this local system. And we could also do it so we could go NTFRS DS and then identify the name of a computer, DC Nugget. 3, for example, which is another domain controller I have online right now, and it'll identify information out of DC Nugget 3, so you can run this across the network and look at other domain controllers for this information. And then finally, there's a tool called FRS Diag, which is extremely detailed and verbose, and we, of course, won't go through all of the details of it because it's a study all, all of its own. However, if you go ahead and run this, this is a tool that you download from Microsoft, although it was in the resource kit, let's go back here, even though it was in the resource kit tools directory, it's not included with the resource kits by default, so you have to download it separately. Once you've gotten it, however, it can do a whole lot of stuff for you, and you can use it to connect to other machines. I can, well, I'll just select, you know, a couple of these different machines here, and then I can go ahead and run various kinds of tests against them. I can just hit go to do a really, really verbose tests against just about everything relating to the file replication service. And the FRS, by the way, is what we use to replicate between sysvols, and that's why it's relevant to group policy objects. Uh, also, for example, I could use the various tools within this, and I could force replication on the target server, for example, and then we see that we did a successful replication there. And that might be very useful if one of the domain controllers was offline for some reason, and when it came back up, it didn't seem to get a kick in the pants and replicate automatically, so we need to, to kind of force it here. So again, this FRS Diag tool is uh, pretty verbose and gives you quite a lot of good information and a lot of good abilities with it. In this nugget, we continued our discussion of group policy objects, and this was part three. We started off with a discussion of delegation so that we could make sure that we could not only manage the links, but that, so that we could also change group policy and edit group policy. We also took a look at troubleshooting group policy, which can be significant because there might be in a large enterprise quite a few different policies to have to manage. And we could take a look at how slow links will affect those policies. For example, it might affect the ability for a profile to download or not. We can change the threshold for a slow link. And then we took a look at the resultant set of policy tool. This is possibly the most powerful tool that we have in terms of diagnostics and troubleshooting, and it can be run either in logging mode, which identifies things that are already there, or planning mode, which identifies what could happen if you were to make a change. We also took a look at GPO tool, which identifies the overall health of your group policy objects, as well as FRS utilities, such as NTFRS UTL or UTIL, and FRS Diag. And these file replication service tools are important because remember that big pieces of your group policy objects are actually stored within the sysvol, and it's the file replication service that makes sure that they get from one domain controller to the next. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.